Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem or the second medium problem from the leak code contest maximum product of the length of two palindromic substrings. It's a mouthful and it's a bit of a complex problem. So let's actually just start out with the brute force solution. But let's first actually understand the problem. We're given a single string S. We want to find two disjoint palindromic subsequences from S such that the product of their lengths is maximized. So by disjoint, they basically mean that the two palindromic subsequences cannot share any characters from the string or basically any characters from the same index of the string. And all we need to do is return the maximum product, not the strings themselves or the subsequences or anything like that. And you definitely need to have an understanding of what a subsequence is. So they give a good example down here. So this is the string S, right? Let's say it's leak code com. Uh, one subsequence is on top. Uh, basically, we can you know choose any characters from the string and you know skip characters as we choose. Uh, but they have to stay in the same order, of course, right? So you can see these are in the same relative order as they appeared in the input string, right? We can't just move this one over here. And you can see that the second uh, subsequence down here is non-overlapping, right? This D does not overlap with the green one. This doesn't overlap. This doesn't overlap either, right? So this is a palindromic subsequence, CDC. Length three, this is also one, ETE. It's palindromic, right? The first and last character is the same. And then the middle character is just a single character, right? So it's length three. I'm assuming you do know what palindromic means. If not, you can probably Google it and then understand in like two seconds. So we take three times three and we get nine and it turns out that that's the longest one, right? But how did they know that? They didn't really explain it, right? So that's why we're gonna start out with the brute force and pretty much the brute force is about as good as you can do in this problem. There's some small optimizations you can do, but don't try to get anything super efficient. And they actually tell us that the max length of the string, I think is uh, at most 12 or something like that. So since it's not a super long string, they're kind of hinting at us that the brute force solution is gonna be okay in this case. So the first thing to be familiar with in this problem is what is a bit mask? And I'm gonna be explaining this a little bit to you and explaining why exactly we need it. So the first thing is how do we know if two particular subsequences from this string are disjoint? That is the main reason why we're using a bit mask. Uh, because it's just easier to do with a bit mask. Uh, you know, if you had a subsequence, right, like E, T, E, and then C, D, C, it, we could just run a while loop to make sure that they don't have any overlapping characters, but it's easier to handle this with a bit mask. And let me show you why. So we're going to have one spot in the bit mask for each character that we have in the input. So we have about, I think, 11 characters in the input. So let's have 11 zeros uh, representing the bit mask, right? These are 11 zeros, one for each character. So for ETE, this is what the bit mask would look like, right? We put a one at every spot that we found a character, right? At the second spot, we had a character. At the fourth spot, we had a character. And I think at the eighth spot, we had a character. So that's where we put our ones representing the string ETE, right? The, the subsequence ETE. And we're gonna do the same thing with CDC down there. So you can see uh, we did the exact same thing with CDC, right? We put a one where each time a character actually shows up in the uh, subsequence, right? So now the reason why we're using a bit mask once again is to check if these two subsequences are disjoint. Now, why does this binary representation help us do that? Because you might remember there's an operation you can run on two binary strings uh, called AND, right? Logic AND. What it does is it goes through each bit, uh, each uh, matching bit, and then it checks, are they both one? In this case, they're both zero, so that evaluates to zero. Again, they're both zero, so that evaluates to zero. Here, one of them is one, but one of them is zero. And we know that they're never, in this entire uh, pair of, of subsequences, they're never both gonna be one because we know for sure that these two strings are disjoint. So as long as this entire thing evaluates to zero, then we can guarantee that these two uh, subsequences are disjoint. So that's why we're using a bit mask. That's why we're representing these in binary form, and that's why we're going to use the AND operation to determine if two uh, subsequences happen to be disjoint. So, okay, great. We have an easy way to do that, but we're not done yet. We still have a lot of work to do in terms of brute forcing this problem. 
Okay, so now if we want to find the maximum possible result we can return first, we actually have to go through every single subsequence we can create from this input string, right? And you might be thinking, well, can we use backtracking to do that recursive backtracking? You're definitely right. That's a possible way. But with this binary representation, we can actually do it in an easier way. So it's a good thing to learn. So if you haven't done this before, this is a very good problem for you to pay attention to. So let's go through that. We know that every single subsequence could be represented by a binary representation, right? Like, like if I just change all these zeros and change this one into a one, that represents the subsequence of just this character, right? Now, if I uh, change this binary number to two, which means this stays zero and this changes into a one, right? This, uh, this would be binary two. Uh, then we just get this character, right? And we could so on and so on, right? If we want to do binary three, we can do uh, like this, right? Uh, and then keep doing that until uh, we've gotten, you know, basically completed this entire number, right? Like one, 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 one. Right, so how can we do that? You actually don't need recursion. We can actually do this with a for loop, right? Because you can tell the length of the input string and the length of how many zeros we have is 11 because that's how many characters we have. So really we can run a for loop starting at, let's say I equals one, right? Because if we had all zeros, then that would just mean we didn't take any characters, right? That's not a subsequence, but we're starting at one because then we're just taking the first character and we're going all the way up until two to the power of 11, but not including two to the power of 11. Why is that? Because two to the power of 11 is basically taking all of these zeros and adding a one over here. So we're gonna keep going up until we reach this number. The number right before we reach this number is gonna just be one, 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 right? So th that would be all the characters. But, but we're obviously not gonna wanna do one, zero, 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 because that would mean we're not including any of these characters, right? So we're gonna stop before we get to this. So this is basically, this loop is basically us enumerating every single subsequence from this string. Okay, now we can do that. What else do we need to do? The next thing we're gonna do is for every single subsequence, this for loop gives us that for every single subsequence, for example, let's say we had uh, this subsequence where these three are ones, meaning with this, char this character and this character. How do we know if this is a subsequence, right? Because we're not looking at the string itself. Remember, when we're doing this for loop, we're going through the binary representation. So how can we convert this binary representation to know if it's an actual palindrome or not? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do it. And to be honest, the way I took it, I had a harder way first, but I saw a clever way to do it from the leak code discuss section. So I'm gonna be showing you that clever way. From this binary representation, we can start at one or at the first bit, right? And change this to, and have, and maintain ourselves a one and then and it with the bit. If the and turns out to be a, a true, right? Like if this was a one and this was a one, that means we were choosing this character, meaning we're choosing this character. And then if we did, then we'd build that string. So we're just gonna, t we're basically transforming this binary representation to the string, to the palindrome it represents. So in this case, we're obviously not including this. Then we're gonna take our one here and then shift it uh, by one. And we're gonna keep doing that until we've shifted it 11 times and we've gotten to the end of our binary representation. Uh, we're gonna go here, we're not including this character, we're not including this character. We're gonna run the and operation and it's gonna turn true, right? Meaning we are including this character, so we are including an E character from above. So we're gonna remember that, we're gonna keep track of that E down here. Uh, next, we're gonna go here, we're not including it, not including it, not including it. Uh, we have this T, so we're gonna add that to the output. Uh, not including this, we do have this E, so let's add that to the output as well. Uh, we're not including this either. So now we've taken our binary representation, right? And then converted it into a string. Now we just wanna know, is this string a palindrome or not? How can we do that? Just by reversing the string and then comparing if it's equal to itself, right? So in this case, it is. ETE is equal to itself reversed. So now we know for sure that this string is a palindrome. So what are we gonna do? Remember, we're just brute forcing it for now. We just wanna figure out every single subsequence that is a palindrome and what its length is. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna maintain a hash map where the key of the hash map, the key is gonna be equal to the bit mask or the binary representation of the string, right? The bit mask is what's gonna be the key and the value of the hash map is gonna be the length 
of the palindrome. And we're, to our hash map, we're only going to be adding the, the bit masks that are actually palindrome. So we found one so far, right? We found ETE. So we're going to say the length of it is equal to three. I know there's a lot of steps to this algorithm, so it's pretty confusing, but we are just brute forcing it. So by the end that we have filled up our hash map, what is our hash map going to represent? It's going to have as key values all the bit masks that are palindromes, and the value is going to be the length of those palindromes. So once we have that, then we can actually finally compute our result. We can find the maximum possible product we can create of two palindromic subsequences that are disjoint. And let me show you how. I'm not going to draw it out because that'll probably just make it more confusing. I'll show you in the code. But just remember this hash map that we're building, that's our goal. Because once we have this hash map, we have solved the problem and we can brute force the problem. So what I've shown you so far, the roughly the time complexity of it is going to be two to the power of n, where n is the length of the input string. But when we actually go through and calculate the products, the we're going to be running a nested for loop on our hash map. Uh, so in the hash, our hash map could be of size two to the power of n. So since it's nested, we're basically taking this and squaring it which is mathematically roughly four to the power of n. So that's kind of the worst case time complexity of the way that I'm showing you how to do it. But it runs pretty efficiently on leak code, so I think it's good enough. So now let's finally jump into the code. Okay, so now getting into the code, one thing I'm gonna do is just take the length of our input string because we're definitely gonna be needing that a lot. And I'm also gonna initialize our hash map that we were talking about. It's a palindrome hash map, right? The hash map is just gonna represent all bit maps or bit masks that are uh, palindromes and then the length of them. So uh, let's just write that here, bit mask. Uh, is going to be mapped to the length. Okay, and now remember, we're going to be going through every possible bit mask. Uh, so remember how we were doing that? We were going to go from one all the way to two to the power of uh, n, whatever the length happens to be. So starting from one, going from two to the power of n in this case, or this is actually a slightly less efficient way to calculate it, just how, you know, uh, CPUs work and all that. So a slightly more efficient way to do it is just say one bit shifted to the left by n, right? J and uh, just so you know, it's basically the same thing. So one shifted to the left by n is exactly equal to two to the power of n. People just write it this way because it's slightly more efficient. Then remember for this bit mask, right? We have it represented as binary as a number, but we want to change it into a string. So let's do that now. And remember how we were going to be doing that. We're going to be uh, going through every single spot in the bit mask. So we can do that. Just uh, how many times are we going to be doing that? Of course, n because there's n spots in the bit mask. So that tells us how many times to execute our for loop and how are we going to actually, you know, know what position we're we're at, we're going to basically be one bit shifted to the left by I. So in the first iteration, we're going to be at index uh, zero, and then we're going to be at index one, index two, etc. in the string S, right? Now we want to know, does our bit mask, whatever it happens to be, does it actually include the character at this position? How can we figure that out? We can say if the mask and did logic and with this value. And if it happens to be one, that means we are going to be including this character. So basically to our subsequent string that we're, uh, you know, keeping track of how the mask looks like when it's converted to a string, we're going to be adding uh, that character at index i, s of i. And I don't want to get you too confused with this line, but in case you're wondering why we're doing index i, because aren't we iterating through the mask from right to left. So why are we adding uh, the character from left to right? You could change this to n minus i minus one to make sure that we are adding it from the right side, but it works both ways. And I won't get too in detail why, because I don't want to over confuse you. You can look into that on your own or ask in the comments if you'd like. But the simplest way is to add s of i. So then once we have converted this mask into a string, now at the end, we finally want to know, is it a palindrome or not? If it's a palindrome, we'll add it to our palindrome hash map and uh, add its length to the hash map as well. 
So easiest way to know if it's a palindrome is just check if it's equal to the reverse of itself. So in Python, you can do that just like this. We can check if it's equal to the reverse. If it is, then we'll take into our pally map, we'll take the bit mask because that's what we wanna know as the key. Why are we adding the bit mask as the key rather than the string? Because remember, the bit mask is very important for us. It will easily allow us to determine if two uh, strings or subsequences are disjoint. So that's why we're doing that. So then uh, the value we'll be adding is the length of its subsequence and then we're good to go. So this loop is the bulk of what you really need to figure out in this problem. The next uh, nested for loop is literally just the brute force that we're going to do to determine what's the longest a pair of disjoint subsequences. So it's just going to be a nested for loop on our hash map up above. So mask one M1 uh, is going to be iterating through Pali and then a second loop for M2 is going to also be iterating through the same hash map. And we're basically going through every pair of bit masks. We want to know if they're disjoint how do we determine that remember that's what we went over at the beginning if m and it with m2 is equal to zero then we know these are disjoint and if they are disjoint we want to know what's the longest uh what's the length of their product and that's the result that we want to return right so up above i have result initialized to zero but we might be able to update it we want to maintain the maximum so we'll take the max of itself and the max of the product of these two you know the lengths of these two palindromes how do we get the lengths that's what we stored in our palindrome map right now you know why i stored the length in there because that's what we're going to use to actually calculate this so we'll take the length of the first one multiplied by the length of the second one and you know that's the whole thing we just brute forced this uh nested for loop so then we can go ahead and return the result well we know for sure it's correct because we brute forced it we don't know how efficient it's going to be until we actually run the code so let's do that right now and on the left you can see it's a more efficient than at least 60 percent that's good enough for me i don't know about you <laughs> but i really hope that this was helpful if it was please like and subscribe it supports the channel a lot consider checking out my patreon where you can further support the channel and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.